So I think we need to start by taking a moment to consider the state of the world that we live in today. We've just been through a period of soaring inflation. Obviously, there was a global pandemic that included constant attacks on our living standards. The cost of living crisis, climate change and wars are erupting all over the world. And so for us, it's very clear that capitalism is in its deepest ever crisis. The world is in complete turmoil. And this is something that is felt by millions, if not billions of people all around the world. They just sense that something is wrong. And the idea that we used to have that perhaps we can grow up and buy a house and get a job and start a family and live a nice life is no longer a reality that people aspire to. Uh, and I think this is especially true for young people in Britain, yes, but all over the world. This is the backdrop to which everything is happening. Now, if you enter onto the scene, then the actions of the US and US imperialism, which as a whole, we would say remains the most dominant, the most reactionary force on the entire planet. British imperialism then acts as a lapdog to that, right? Britain will follow America in whatever it does on the world stage. And what we are witnessing in Palestine is perhaps the most extreme, egregious example of what imperialism and what America and Britain are willing to do in order to shore up their own economic and political interests. But actually, we know that they have done this before. In fact, they have done this and acted with total impunity for years. They did not hesitate at all in unleashing bloody wars against Iraq and Afghanistan, which lasted for two decades, in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed. They bombed Libya, Syria, Sudan, Serbia, without any regard for the people there, um, and many of which uh, died horrific, horrible deaths. One of the most atrocious cases in, in recent times has been the barbaric war against the people of Yemen, which is one of the poorest countries on the planet. And this is a war waged by Saudi Arabia, but with the full support and complicity and active participation of the USA and Britain and, and many other imperialist powers. Something like 150,000 people have been killed in Yemen. And whilst all of this takes place, all of these atrocities with the support, the financing um, and, and political support of, of Britain and other countries in the West, no one does anything, right? In the mainstream, in mainstream politics and in mainstream media, no one calls any of this out and no one expresses genuine opposition to what is taking place. But now we're living through a moment where it feels like something bigger is developing when it comes to the question of, of Palestine. And there's things in the news happening literally every single day that is provoking this movement to move in a much more powerful way than perhaps it has done in the past. And obviously, recently, we've had this uh, announcement from the, 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 the main prosecutor of the ICC, to seek an arrest warrant for Netanyahu and, and Gallant, the defense minister. And, you know, when things like this happen, it's like another wave in the movement. And I think, you know, for some people, their hopes are raised when they hear things like this. But I actually, I think this very quickly is going to not kind of dilute the movement into safe channels, because obviously when these things happen, there's a tendency to think, OK, well, now finally someone is standing up to, to Israel and these legal channels are going to sort things out. Very, very quickly, it will become apparent to people that this isn't the route forward. And actually, I think it will become another source of deep anger because now the government in Britain is trapped itself in this situation where it's having to try and condemn what the ICC is doing when not that long ago, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the West 
instantly united to condemn Russia, condemn them for war crimes, isolate them entirely on the world stage, send lots of money to Ukraine and support the Ukrainian response, and also support the issuing of arrest warrants towards um, uh, Putin um, and Putin's government with, with, with very little evidence. But very, very quickly, they united behind um, these institutions that were trying to, to stop Putin. But now suddenly they have to change their tune and say, well, actually what the ICC is doing is, is not helpful, I think, were the words of Rishi Sunak. Um, I mean, according to Netanyahu, the actions of, of, the, of the prosecutor putting forward this arrest warrant is simply just a new version of anti-Semitism. That's the, the, the line that Netanyahu is taking with this. And so it's trapped the government in Britain in this kind of uh, backwards position where their whole hypocrisy when it comes to war, when it comes to war crimes is being exposed. And the reason that I wanted to bring this out is because every single time one of these events takes place, it adds to the anger that exists um, in, in society and that exists amongst young people, especially. There's another um, example of this that I think is worth bringing up. There's been a lot of noise in the media about Biden, about how Biden in private is really annoyed at Netanyahu. And it keeps getting leaked to the press that, no, 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 in private, Biden's just furious. He's just tearing his hair out. He's just, he's so angry um, at what's happening. Or he's accidentally leaving his mic on in certain meetings where he's whispering to people, I, I'm telling him that he's doing the wrong thing. But rather than calming down the movement, again, every single thing they do is just provoking a new wave of anger. Um, there is not one person that believes um, these kind of fake uh, performances from, from Biden. It means nothing. Every single thing that Netanyahu does is done with Washington's blessing. Why is that? Because Washington is providing all of the means for it. That's what it comes down to at the end of the the day. Um, and that is the center of the first and, and main demand of this entire movement, right, which is to divest, the, the call to divest from, from Israel. We believe that every single university should cut ties with arms companies, multinationals and banks, which are directly or indirectly complicit in what's happening in Gaza and in the oppression of the Palestinian people as a whole. It's very simple for us. No one should be profiting from genocide. And that is really the center of this whole movement. Not only that, but the fact that that takes place, that investment takes place whilst universities are actually in this country on the brink of bankruptcy. We are seeing departments and course closures as well as massive layoffs taking place. Staff in universities have been fighting for wage increases and better working conditions for years. They've been fighting to keep their pensions on the right terms. The whole of the higher education sector actually is at a breaking point, and it has been that way for, for quite a while. And yet students are paying extortionate tuition fees and rents. And so that forms another part of our demands, which is we demand to know where is this money going? Open up the books for inspection by staff and students so we can decide where to invest. And we definitely, universities shouldn't be sat on pots of money whilst charging you know, students extortionate rent and investing in arms companies over here or um, banks over there or anything like this. Ultimately, we stand for free education. And, and all of this is entirely linked up to why I think the movement now has taken on a bigger character than it has in the past. I mean, if we're clear about it, the Palestine movement today is reaching global proportions. We've seen that in the protests that have been taking place on the streets ever since October, you know, millions of people in the streets all over the world. But also the fact that the encampments started in the first place were that the encampments were a recognition of the fact that A to B marches um, in the streets are not enough. We need to do something more, more direct and more targeted. Obviously, the encampments began in, in, in the US, but then they spread to Canada, to Europe, but also as far as Australia and Japan. 
the point is the the cause of the Palestinians is morphing into the cause and could morph into the cause of oppressed people everywhere. And it's resonating very, very deeply. At the same time, we recognize that this is something that's going to move in different ways. People are politicized and radicalized, I would say, in different ways and at different times. The encampments don't all look the same. We can be honest about that, have a kind of balance sheet as to where they're going. Some are bigger than than others. Some have lasted longer than others. But our job is to try and connect all of these things together. And we have the political um, base in society and the political need, I would say, to do that. And what do I mean by that? The first thing that we should explain when we're at the encampments and we're trying to get other people to join is that the same people who are responsible for the massacre of the Palestinians are the same people responsible for the cuts and austerity wrecking havoc in all of our lives in Britain today. Um, And they're going to continue this austerity and continue these attacks. Soon, or the government announced a while ago that they wanted to increase defence spending by two and a half percent. Meanwhile, the NHS is falling apart. And as I said earlier, universities are completely threatened with bankruptcy. Last Saturday, I went to the the NACBA 76 demonstration uh, in, in central London. And someone there asked me on, on the demonstration, you know, why, why do you care so much about Palestine? What, you know, what kind of brought you to this? I think we have to say it's it's because of everything that's happening in the world. It's because of the of the class root of the problem. These people put profit above our healthcare, above our education, above our housing, and also above the lives of the Palestinians. And that is why the movement has so much potential to grow in a really powerful direction. Now, all of that anger was already existing in society. And on top of that, yesterday, um, Rishi Sunak came out in the pouring rain, looking like a drowned rat, looking very sad and very miserable, and announced a general election uh, to take place in, in six weeks. And so how should we respond to this? Because we have to respond to this as as, as a movement. And the first thing we should say is that, okay, this general election is going to take place at a time when people are furious with the government. They hate, they literally despise the Tories. If you talk to anyone, this is absolutely crystal clear and people want them out. And it's also clear to us that Palestine is going to dominate this election. The issue of Palestine is is having it such a moment in the media that it's going to dominate a lot of the discussions and a lot of the ways in which people try and respond to any people who stand. The invasion of Rafa is ongoing and is going to continue for sure over the next six weeks. And neither Sunak nor Starmer clearly are on the side of the Palestinians. And people know that. So any candidate who's standing should be asked this. What do you stand for and who do you support? Are you on the side of the oppressed or the oppressors? Are you on the side of the exploited or the exploiters? And I think the encampments can become a hub for exactly this kind of discussion. Every single one of the encampments should be places for open debates about ideas and demands where we should be constantly clarifying our strategy and our programme. On top of this, I would say general assemblies should be held regularly, and these should be held alongside teach outs on topics relating to what is happening right now. We should be having teach outs on imperialism. What is imperialism? Where does it come from and what drives it? As well as on the history that flows very neatly into the history of of Palestine um, and of Israel. I think encampments should consider if they want to invite independent left candidates that are standing against Starmer, for example, and the Tories, and consider inviting them to the encampments to say, will you support this? Is this what you stand for? And on that basis, use that to connect with other people on the question of Palestine, yes, but also more generally, the question of austerity um, and and, and the other issues that are plaguing us in, in Britain today. Off the back of these discussions, you can have rallies, weekly rallies, mass assemblies and walkouts that could be planned. 
When a general election takes place, it can be a moment in which the issue of politics is pushed more to the forefront of people's minds than maybe in their day-to-day -day, everyday life. It's going to touch every corner of society. And that includes schools. School students could have mass walkouts in support of the encampments to come down um, and, and support what is going on, but also in relation to the election itself. You could have candidates going to schools, trying to win over um, staff and students, and, and, and we should be in involved in that. Um, and, and when we think about schools in general, you know, we know that students are very politicized over this issue, um, but they're also politicized by the general crisis of capitalism, which, you know, has put asbestos in the walls of schools. They're, they're literally on the verge of falling apart. And we could connect all of these struggles by saying clearly, we stand for free education. Why is there money for bombs, but no money for books? It's a, it's, it's, and it's with those ideas that people can be won over. The general election is going to be about six weeks long. People are going to be a bit apathetic towards it, but also more so than that, they're going to be very angry. And we have to connect with that and say, what is the alternative? If you hate the Tories and you hate Labour and you hate the whole sham of Parliament and every single one of these politicians who do nothing for us really then you should be involved in the kind of politics that is centred around actually moving things forward and us taking control of what is happening. And then we have the whole of the summer months to prepare and, and grow on that, right? So what do I mean? I think over July, June, July um, and August, we should use this time to think about the freshers that is going to come up in September and October, where I would say the whole of this movement could be reignited, right? Movements are not something that just kind of go up and up and up and up and up forever and ever and ever. They can go through ups and downs and ups and downs. And, and the freshers period, I think, should be at the, the forefront of our minds as, as a time that it could be reignited in a huge way. You're going to have hundreds of thousands of young people, students coming to university for the first time. These are people who've had to spend a couple of years um, in, in lockdown doing their GC CSCs online or whatever it is, they've experienced nothing but cuts. Some of them might be 18, they might be old enough to vote in this election. And what's their option? Two different war criminals who stand for the exact same thing. So what we should do over the summer is educate ourselves politically in the arguments to win people over to our position. We need to follow the news and stay up to date and help others stay up to date. We should prepare leaflets and posters so that when the freshers come back, we can put leaflets and posters through every single door in all of the accommodation blocks, plaster the entire town and the entire university with this material. Some of the encampments have a bit of an excess of, of funds. They've got some money left over and they're wondering what to do with it. Use it to print leaflets, use it to book rooms, to plan this campaign in a bigger way. It's not going to look the same at every single university. That's clear. Everywhere is going to have its own particularities, but everywhere can do something. So whatever happens on the 4th of July, on, on this uh, the date of the election, we need to think about the 5th of July. We need to think about how are we going to fight what is likely to be a right wing Labour government? That is what is facing us. And we should be honest, look, this could grow into a bigger, much more powerful student movement, but students alone only have so much power. Ultimately, the strongest force in society is the working class. And in different encampments, I know students have gone to the Trades Council to try and get them on board. And the way we're going to win them over is by connecting all of our demands against militarism with the need for free healthcare, better housing, better pensions, and so on. So to summarize, I would say there's, there's three stages to this whole campaign. The first is the general election. The second is the summer months, this time to educate, prepare ourselves politically, gather as many people as you can, and then freshers where we re-hit this whole movement. And it will sort of be dependent on what is happening in, in Palestine and, and how far the invasion into Rafah goes. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly what's going to take place. Um, but what we know is a whole generation of people are coming up wanting and ready to fight. But I would say this has to be done on a united national basis as much as possible. 
the encampments need in every single place a genuinely elected leadership that should be meeting to discuss the next steps. And that doesn't just mean the organizational tasks of running the camp, though clearly those are necessary. What we are talking about here is moving things up a level politically. The people that we are up against are very powerful. And they're not just individuals. Everyone can see that. We're not just talking about a few bad apples here, the Suella Bravemans of, of, of the world. We are talking about imperialism. We are talking about a global system that drives war. We're talking about, about why they have to conquer new markets, land, resources. Why is that the basis of the world today? And I'll end by this. I know that there are different ideas out there in the encampments um, and in other places. And, and some people think that when you take the issue beyond Palestine, you're weakening the struggle and you're weakening the issue. And I think that's wrong. I think that the reason the Palestine movement today now is becoming larger than it ever has done in the past is precisely because it's connected to people's faith in the entire system. That is what is being shaken by the austerity that they're experiencing every day, by the threat of climate change, and yes, by the horrors and atrocities in Palestine. So I think we've got to use that as a strength and use that now to escalate. Ultimately, that is what the Revolutionary Communist Party is striving to do. We are striving to become a voice for all of the anger that is in society, because we know that that anger is just going to deepen. And if you agree with that, then we would really appeal for you above all to, to join us now and join us in our task to, to grow this movement and make it a national fight back. Thanks.